Well, we're lucky at Northern Lights to have Dana Bourgeois again. Uh, after his last uh, seminar and talk with us about tapping, uh, tone tapping, and guitar voicing, today here's, he's here to talk to us about uh, tone woods. And there's a big pile of woods right here that uh, I guess we're going to find out what each and every one of them is. So give a nice round of applause to Dana Bourgeois. Great. Uh, well, thanks, Dan. Thanks, Northern Lights, for having us up here. Uh, I always love coming to Littleton. Uh, we had a lovely ride up through the mountains. Uh, couldn't help noticing that summer's almost over up in these parts. <laughs> uh, no, well, we did see snow on the peaks, so I guess it's coming down this way soon. And it, a, 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 as will be the case with us down on the plain, <coughs> farther down in the Androscoggin Valley. Um, so when I was here last year, um, one of the things that I, I think one, one of the little tidbits that I threw out was that kind of in my book, you know, a guitar sounds, is a combination of th really three elements. It's the, the design that the builder chooses, the actual pieces of woods that are chosen, and then the decisions that the builder makes along the way of building. Um, last, in my last talk, I talked about the decision part of it, which is essentially the voicing of a guitar top. And uh, tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about the materials, the major materials. Um, I think. Um, I brought a bunch of different tone woods and we're going to tap and listen and uh, I'm going to um, sort of throw out my thoughts of what different tone woods sound like and how they work in guitars and I'm sure you'll have a zillion questions and I'll be, uh, be happy to accommodate as many as I can. Um, so I tend to Let's start with the backs. Well, let's, okay, let's, let's talk a little bit about sort of the function of the top and the back. Um, so the guitar strings are attached uh, to the top via the bridge. And this, the, essentially the way, kind of the way a guitar works is kind of like a, like a speaker, a little speaker. The top is kind of like a speaker cone, and the back and the top are kind of like the, enclo the speaker enclosure. There's quite a bit of science to, um, you know, how air cavities work and how ports work. And um, if the guitar were a true speaker cabinet, it would be built very heavy and thick. And so it's possible to build a guitar that way. Um, some people build a guitar so that the back is essentially uh, a secondary resonator. And that's kind of my style of building. If you look at, you know, like a classical guitar on one end of the spectrum uh, has a very flexible top and a, and a very, very stout bracing back and sides. Um, you know, years ago, a number of guitar, classical guitar builders you know, when people were switching from Brazilian to Indian rosewood, a number of classical guitar makers said, hey, it doesn't make much of a difference. And, and it's probably true, you know, if, you're, if you build a very stout back and side. Um, the hallmark of a, of a stout back and side um, is that the guitar has tremendous projection. A classical guitar player wants to be able to project without a mic to the last seat in the auditorium. And um, so really the top is doing all of the work and the back and side are acting kind of like a reflective surface. Um, the other, on the other side of the spectrum, you have a, a, a back uh, which, is at, which can be actually very lively. Um, let's look at two different kinds of steel string guitars. Uh, Martins are a little bit on the heavy build side. The backs are built a little bit more heavily. And Martins are known for having a very robust sound, you know, very good projection. Uh, it's the guitar of choice for a bluegrass player if you've got a banjo and fiddle and mandolin in the band. 
Uh, Gibson guitars on the other end of the spectrum have a, a very light back and these guitars <clears throat> are a little bit less ro robust, a little bit less loud. But often the pre-war examples have a tremendous richness and that's the result of a resonating back. And the, uh, the amount of, so in, in, uh, in the case of a very resonant back, <coughs> excuse me, the more resonant the back, the more um, uh, the species of back will come into play. You can, the more that you, you can hear. I generally break backs into two categories, <clears throat> rosewoods and non-rosewoods. Um, the rosewood guitars, to my ear, rosewood, uh, different types of rosewood have, in general, um, a little bit of a metallic kind of sound, that's kind of how I describe it, versus a woody sound for, say, like a mahogany guitar. Um, rosewood has, a lot of rosewood have, has what I call a little bit of a natural reverb, um, a little slower uh, harmonic bloom. It sounds like a little bit, you know, it's like the reverb on, setting the reverb on two. It's a little wetter, lusher kind of sound. Whereas the mahogany, a mahogany guitar and, and guitars of woods similar to mahogany have a little bit drier sound, a little bit more immediate, a little bit less complex, a little bit um, um, more, as I say, a more of a, an immediate sound. Uh, just to kind of describe what that means, let, let's, let's listen to um, what a, what a few guitar, what a few different types of wood sound like. So when I'm picking, so there's a couple, you know, if I back off a little bit, different species have different characteristic tones, but within a species you get quite a bit of a variety. And so if you kind of know a player's preference, you can, you know, you can select the species and then you can select the individual piece of wood. And then there's also, you know, some woods in, in my, to my ear will sound better on a large guitar or on a finger style guitar. Some will sound better on a smaller guitar. So you have to sort of, sort of um, factor in all of these things as you select wood. It's one of the funnest things we do. Um, you know, every Friday, all of the, we, we know we'll start a new batch of guitars. Uh, the orders will come in from James. We lay them out on the selection table and go to the wood stash, you know, on racks behind us and actually pick out the wood. Uh, some of our wood choices are made because the, you know, the piece is only so large and it can only make a small guitar. Or, you know, the customer likes a certain kind of look and you kind of have to work around these things. But um, let's dig in a little bit. People frequently say, well, you know, I kind of like, you know, a rosewood kind of OM, but I'm not really sure, you know, what's, if, if I pair it with a, uh, you know, like a, a torrified Adirondack top with, uh, what's the difference between a, what, what a uh, Madagascar rosewood and a Coca-Bolo guitar will sound like? You know, so we, we get these questions a lot. Um, and the way, the way we answer them is literally by listening to the wood. There's a couple of things that come into play. One is um, uh, sort of the weight and the stiffness of the wood. And then the other is what it sounds like when you tap it. Ideally, uh, you want to be able to hold a piece of wood anywhere and tap it anywhere and get a note. Get a nice, big, full, ringy, musical note. That actually never happens. Uh, you, so you kind of have to hunt around and find places to hold and tap. And a good piece of wood will have a lot of places that, that will, will produce a sound. You know, and maybe uh, a less good set of wood won't, won't have as many, you know, places where it will respond. Uh, 
a rectangular panel of wood is, is a lousy size. Um, uh, the, the lower bout of a guitar, which is a nice round vibrating area with a bridge right in the middle, is actually a fairly efficient way uh, for a piece of wood to, for a sheet of wood to vibrate. A, a rectangular is not very good. So, you know, we, and the, we have to take into account the size of the wood. The, like, for example, some dealers will give us a funky cut like this. Some dealers will give us uh, sort of cut corners like this. Some dealers will, um, uh, will give us a long piece, a thick piece. You know, what you, so you have to kind of use your experience and, and uh, make, make allowances when you're, when you're tapping wood. Um, you can sit there and chop up a piece of wood with a band on the bandsaw and tap it and each cut you make it's going to sound a little differently so there are there are uh, adjustments that you need to that you need to make uh, this is Indian rosewood okay it's you're all familiar with Indian rosewood I'm sure it's a very common uh, uh, building wood India Indian rosewood is now on the CITES too uh, meaning that it's a semi-endangered species and can only be imported or exported uh, with permits. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a little ironic because uh, it, the nation of India does, takes, takes very good care of its natural resources. Um, but uh, be, it, used to, it used to be a little bit more common Let's listen to what Indian Rosewood sounds. To my ear, well, let's, let's do a little tapping. I'm just going to... I'm going to hold it in a different place. So... We're hearing a little bit of highs. We're hearing a little bit of low, um, quite a bit of mid-range in an Indian rose, and, that, and that's really what I hear in an Indian rosewood guitar is a, 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 a very large amount of mid-range. So on the other end of the spectrum is Brazilian rosewood. It was the it was the uh, the rosewood of choice for the you know for the great pre-war uh, American guitars, Martin. Uh, in particular, um, Brazilian rosewood is a CITES one endangered species. The, we can only uh, legally even possess Brazilian rosewood if it has um, pre-convention cert certification, meaning that it's, the wood was harvested prior to 1991. Um, so this is a very old piece of wood. This, this, uh, most of the, the, the wood, you, you can occasionally buy old sets of, of Brazilian rosewood. Most of the sets that are available today are either reclaimed building materials or reclaimed stumps. Um, this was an old building material. This is probably from, from a large beam. You can see a tremendous amount of oxidization. The wood is turned black in the middle. Originally, the wood was more of this tawny brown color. It was probably even lighter than that originally. I have no idea how old this wood is, but I know it's extremely old. Wood doesn't turn black uh, like that. Uh, let's listen to it. You just heard. variety, more different notes. It sounds pretty good almost everywhere I hold it. Very gong-like here, that reverb. Metallic. You can hear the metallic sound. Let me try just just we'll go back to the mahoganies but just for comparison here's a set of mahogany not as mid
mid-rangey as the Indian rosewood. Um, not as ringy, not as reverby as the Brazilian. Um, there's another factor that comes into play here, and it's called velocity of sound. Different woods are rated by how quickly vibration will travel through them. So a higher velocity of sound is generally um, considered a better wood, in theory a better wood. Uh, the, the woods with the highest velocity of sound are Brazilian rosewood and European spruce. Um, so I don't want to confuse, but we'll remember the Brazilian rosewood. The closest wood in to Brazilian that's out there is Madagascar rosewood. Um, it has a similar velocity of sound. Uh, this wood is quite a bit newer. It's, it's also a CITES II wood. Um, it is probably more endangered than, than its classification um, um, would indicate just because I think anything living in Madagascar is endangered. Uh, but um, this, this wood has been harvested a lot more recently. Uh, Madagascar ranges in color all over the place. This is a particularly light example. It has a lot of the grain features you know, of, the, of, of Brazilian rosewood. Uh, let's listen a little bit. that metallic ring on the very top end, a nice low bottom, not so much of a thick middle as the Indian rosewood. Not quite as lively as the Brazilian. This is a, actually a spectacular set of Brazilian tone-wise. That's why I brought it as a good example, but this will make a heck of a nice sounding guitar. Um, another wood that is very popular uh, as a sort of Brazilian substitute is cocobolo. Here's a set of quarter song cocobolo. There's another set right there on this particular guitar. And by the way, when we're done, you're welcome to come up and try some of these guitars here. That's a cocobolo back, uh, a Macassar ebony back, probably Indonesian ebony. Uh, Brazilian rosewood and Panama rosewood. But let's listen to a little cocobolo. What are we hearing? I'm hearing a lot of low end. Um, uh, cocobolo is 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 actually quite a bit heavier than most of the than, mo than Brazilian rosewood. Uh, makers tend to light, you know, to to make a thinner back, uh, just to get the weight out of the thing. If it's too heavy, it's not going to vibrate quite as freely. Um, we'll go twenty or thirty thou thinner even on a on a cocobolo back. It's our thinnest back. Uh, maybe Zeracote is sometimes that thin. It's also another heavy wood. But sort of, so the more material you take off, the more you will accentuate the bottom end, the lower end, the, the ability to, uh, to vibrate that, you know, that long, low frequency. Uh, we do compensate in the way that we build the back, the back braces. Uh, a coca bowl, a, th a thin back guitar will often get a taller brace. And sometimes there'll be like less scoop as, it, as, as the end of the brace tucks into the lining. So everything is, uh, you know, we try to make all of the, all of the compensations that we need to uh, when dealing with different woods. Uh, just listen. Just real nice, real 
real nice lows with some highs. But Coco Bolo guitars tend to be known for like this, like this really rich bottom end. Um, yes. Are your Coco Bolos kind of difficult to work with? Uh, it can be. Uh, it's it's kind of waxy. Some people are actually allergic to it. It's one of those woods that, you know, Pernambuco is one, Cocobolo is another one. It's, some people are even allergic to walnut dust, but Cocobolo is kind of, fortunately we don't have any, did we ever, did we have, didn't we have someone in the shop who couldn't handle it? I can't Not remember. Recently. Not recently, okay. I've heard in some, in, in some of the bigger, I mean, we only have, we've a max of 20 employees. Um, I've heard peop some people in some of the bigger shops can't even be around the dust. Um, but I don't find it that difficult to work with. I mean, we thickness with a, uh, with a wide belt sander. And we don't, by the way, resaw in any of our woods. We buy from suppliers. We buy wood that's already been processed to this stage. It's much easier to evaluate when you're choosing wood, when you're buying wood, when it's already in this stage. If it's in a block or a big flitch, you can't tap it, flex it. You can't you know, get the kind of information that you can when it's at this stage. So it's very risky. Plus, you have to buy in a huge bulk. You cut it all up, and it may be no good. So I, I would prefer to buy wood that's already been processed. So if you've got waxy wood like that, what kind of glues do you use? Uh, well, we use different glues for different applications. Uh, we, use a we use a lot of yellow glue, uh, tight bond too. Uh, we don't use hide glue anymore. We, do, we use fish glue. Um, we do use super glue for some things, for some operations. Um, but, but these waxy woods all will all glue uh, you know, we'll all adhere with these glues. And, and also, with the right sealers, uh, finish will, will adhere as well. And special prep to the edges that you got to glue up? Or? No, we, we don't have to do that. We haven't had guitars falling apart. Um, the glues, but again, we don't, we don't use really exotic glues. We just stopped using hide glues just because they didn't work equally well on all woods, particularly torrified woods, which we'll get into a little bit later. Um, kind of just moving on through the, the, what I consider the rosewood um, family. This is one of our favorites recently. Is, is, uh, it's Paduk. It's from the Andaman Islands in the, uh, in the Indian Ocean. And I believe it's somewhere else in the, in, you know, in the Indian Ocean, other, other places within the Indian Ocean. Um, it's a huge tree. It grows nice and clear. It's not too heavy, closer to the Brazilian rosewood kind of weight. It's not as heavy as the Cocobolo. Um, it's not endangered. It's not listed on CITES. Um, um, and it had, you know, we, we, it, Here's the outside of the board that was sawn, so it turns like a brick red over time with exposure, and it's over, you know, over years with exposure uh, to UV. Um, but it's, you see, it's nice and bright red. Um, another wood that's very similar in weight and sound is a Panama rosewood. This guitar here is a Panama rosewood guitar. We don't have any examples of Panama rosewood right now. It's very hard to get. Um, but we do have a guitar which you can try. Let's tap a little bit here. So all of these rosewoods would make good marimba keys and are used for marimba keys. Um, so you can hear part, you know, they actually sound better when the backs aren't uh, fuzzy like this. I mean, this is, I bet this, this half sounds a little bit better. You can hear a little, a little longer ring. So we're, 
getting kind of nice, round, ringy musical notes in most of the places where I'm holding. Interestingly enough, these are book match sets. They're cut adjacent, right like that. And this one sounds so much better than this one. And it's just simply because of all the fuzziness on the back. It's kind of deadening, deadening some of the vibration. It will sound better when it's cleaned up. Um, and Panama Rosewood actually sounds an awful lot like, like uh, Paduk. This is not a rosewood, but it's, it's kind of not in the, the lighter wood category. Uh, this, is, this is Indian ebony. We made some really cool sounding guitars out of ebony's. I like the lighter weight ebony's. Indian ebony is actually pretty good sounding. Uh, this is an Indonesian ebony guitar, which you can all try out when we're all done. Here's another little thing where you can tell the sound of, of wood. I remember buying some old Brazilian once year, a long time ago, and there was a stack of guitar, a stack of backs, and uh, I was one by one taking uh, a pair of backs off the stack, and you could just hear them ring as you were sliding. So needless to say, I bought a lot of that batch. Uh, this what ebony sounds like. That's why they use it for piano keys. It sounds so good. <laughs> <laughs> surprisingly, surprisingly good sounding for such a heavy wood. Um, again, it's not as metallic sounding, not as reverby sounding as, as the real rosewoods. It's a little bit drier, but, but, but very pleasing nonetheless. Um, let's go on. Here's what I, I'm going to pass around some of these woods so you can, you can check them out. Dana, do you ever work with African blackwood? <laughs> where does that fall in the... African blackwood is heavy, 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 and cracks, 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 cracks. Uh, I'm not a big fan of African blackwood. Um, here, grab that. Well, how is that different than Tasmanian blackwood? Tasmanian blackwood is an acacia, which is closer to koa. So uh, African blackwood is closer to ebony. There's an Indonesian blackwood, which is actually, which is actually green. <laughs> sort of knowing where to hold and tap is a, is a bit of an acquired uh, skill. Yeah, yeah. There you go. You know, it's really not hard to get a great piece of Brazilian to sound good. That's, that's, the, that's the thing about Brazilian. It's, it's the highest velocity of sound. What's second highest? Um, I, I believe it's European spruce. It's, well, it's a softwood, but, it, but velocity of sound is, I mean, the quickness with which it transmits. For backwoods, it's. Well, I'm not really sure. Some of the other rosewoods, I'm, I'm going to bet. I'll bet Madagascar rosewood is up there. I'll bet Cocobolo is up there. Wouldn't you guys like to do this for a living? Which one is this thing? That one's ebony, I believe. Now, you've got the touch. <laughs> It really does. This is probably Cocobolo yeah. is a tropical tree. It probably has it's one of those trees that will have like buttresses and where the buttresses come off the trunk is where you get 
this crazy wood. Um, I call that set the, I used to call it the, the, um, the rings of Saturn pattern, but some, someone else suggested the storms of Jupiter. <laughs> Color-wise, that works. If you have two pieces that are, you know, a big match and you're patting them, one sound is a little different than the other. Which is like changing some of the If they would sound a little different, it would be your fit for one way. Generally, they're going to sound pretty dang similar. By the time you've thickness them and they're, you've cut them to the same size and they're the same dimension and, they're, and they're, they're sanded on both sides, you're not going to hear too much difference. I don't. No, I don't know. I don't have to do. Generally, we, we decide which, which side is out. By the, by the grain pattern, because people want to see a symmetrical grain pattern. And something like this, for example, you know, here's the symmetry side. And because it's not quite quartered, here's the asymmetrical side on this one. You know, in other words, there's more sapwood here because the sapwood grain is running this way. So here's another factor. Fun facts, fun tonewood facts. Um, the same slab of wood, if it is quarter sawn versus plain sawn or flat sawn, the quarter sawn will have the higher velocity of sound. And it's just because of the matrix orientation of the grains. So a lot of people want nice, wild, you know, swirly, weird woods, and you know, pretty woods, and that could be, I don't know, <clears throat> um, I'm going to say even on an electric guitar, I, th I would think that velocity of sound counts for something. The nice, even, straight grain, relatively plain, is usually going to sound better. Now, in the same piece of wood, what you will find is that one piece of wood will have a much higher velocity of sound than the other, and even cut on the, on the slab, it'll be better sounding than a quarter sawn law, and then a quarter sawn piece from a log that doesn't have a good velocity of sound. So the rule is really only applies to the way you cut a specific, pe a specific slab of wood. But in general, the very best sounding guitars, the very best of the best sounding guitars, generally have very plain, straight, quarter sawn wood. Should have straight. Should have. That, by the way, is a quarter sawn set, even though it's kind of swirly and moves around. That's quarter sawn because the grains are running straight. Uh, quarter, you'll, this, is, this is a slab sawn piece. It's actually it's sort of a bastard cut in that it's kind of quarter sawn down the middle, but it goes. It, so in other words, if you look at the end grain, the end grains do this kind of thing and go over this way like that. And you know the middle is kind of what you look at. The middle. You know, just the way the, the whole guitar um, is shaped, you know, most, most of your back is down here, right? What happens out here is only a small portion of it. So if it's nice and quarter sawn down the middle, that's a good sign. This is a very quarter sawn set. Plain quarter sawn. Uh, it, interruptions of knots and stuff is usually has a damping effect because you have differential hardness. Can we see the Brazilian over here? I don't know if it's been over there, but we can send it. So we've we've heard a few of the rosewoods and the heavier woods like ebony. The other family of woods for backs is um, the, uh, essentially mahogany and related woods. 
I tapped you a set of Central American Honduran mahogany. Um, I guess three major kinds of mahogany. Um, the Central American mahogany, which is the most commonly seen on, on guitars. There's also a Cuban mahogany, which is very dense, uh, used quite a bit on furniture. Um, Cuban mahogany is just kind of generic name for Caribbean mahogany. I've seen Cuban ma mahogany uh, in Florida. You know, the, the mahogany, um, if you've ever been to the Everglades and you see these, what do they call them? Uh, in the middle of the Everglades, you'll, you'll see like a little pile, of a bunch of trees and of the mahogany trees. That'll be, that's the Cuban mahogany. Best and, stuff grows in Hawaii. Oh, well, that's, that's transplanted. That would be, yeah, that's Cuban mahogany planted in Hawaii. Um, and then the African mahogany. African is a little bit heavier. It's a little bit ringier. Let's, let's listen a little bit to some of the difference. You heard a little bit about of this compared to the rosewoods. But. Not quite as mid-rangey, you know. Um, nice bottom end, good top end. Not as ringy, not as, um, how shall we say, metallic sounding. Kind of soft. Easy decay. African mahogany is harder. It's going to be a little bit... A little bit more on the rosewood side, but it's not metallic soft and I call it woody round I love I actually I actually prefer heavier mahoganies you get a little more sound you can manipulate it a little bit better um, there's a there is a um, um, some people prefer lighter mahoganies and and you know what um, if 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 a luthier whose guitars sound good, says, I think this is a better wood. Well, what it means is that they found a way to work with that wood. So I try not to say one is better than the other. What I say is, um, you know, the heavier mahoganies work better for my style of building. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> is that what you use in an LDBO? And the, yeah, yeah. And... So there's a lot of buzz about sinker mahogany. We didn't have any sinker mahogany to bring. Sinker mahogany is wood that's been reclaimed essentially from the Amazon or tributaries, wood that's been floated, and as it gets waterlogged, it sinks. Um, generally, the heavier mahogany is what sinks. If it's been underwater long enough, a lot of minerals leach out. It loses a little bit of weight that way, but it's just extremely resonant. Most sinker mahogany is a lot closer in African to sound than it is to Honduran, which is what it actually is. So, um, good stuff. We like it a lot. Uh, <laughs> the African is really is dirt cheap. Most people don't like African for some reason. We like it a lot. What do people call it, Sapel or Sapelli? Sapelli, yeah. Sapelli is one, and there's another one. Um, there's Kaya. another, Kaya. This is Sipo Mahogany. This is Sipo. Yeah, not Sapelli, you're right. Sapelli is, al is also African, it's related. And uh, um, what, what was the. Uh, the, the guitar that you just sold today was uh, the, uh, Macquarie. the Macquarie. Macquarie is an, is an African-like wood, uh, is an African mahogany-like wood. It's about, it's, a, it's, a, it's about the weight of Honduran. It's a lighter wood and uh, very nice sounding wood, very full kind of sounding. Um, so we have varieties within the mahogany as we have varieties within the, the rosewoods. Uh, I've brought a few other examples of common woods. Um, maple, this is a big leaf maple. 
Uh, the best sounding maple, I think, is red maple, the stuff that grows in your, grows in your backyard. Um, however, we can't get large examples of figured maple, so would people tend to like it figured? Um, we build a small guitar, this one right here, the White Rabbit. Is, is, is a curly maple guitar with a translucent finish. So the figure is kind of important. But, and this is, this is a funny shape. It's actually kind of a little on the long side. I should have chopped it off, but let's listen to maple a little bit. Big leaf maple, so it's a West Coast variety. dull compared to some of the other uh, woods we've we've tapped although it's not totally dead it's not cardboard there's some tone there very mid-rangey uh, maple has a reputation for being high and bright I've never heard it um, we again um, our maple guitars actually, so maple is one of those woods that I'll make the back a little on the thicker side of some of the other woods, and I'll do that to get to give it a little bit more resonance. And a maple guitar will sound more, will show off the sound of the top species more so than, than an awful lot of other uh, backwoods, mostly because it's not competing with it, it's not blending with it so much. Here's another common wood, walnut. This is a, an English walnut, a European walnut, but it was grown in Pennsylvania. This is from a gigantic tree uh, that was a, they called the champion, champion walnut. the champion walnut. It was like the largest English walnut in Pennsylvania. Uh, we, we saw it slabbed and at the butt it was nine feet Cross, and this is from one of the branches, and and the it has this beautiful broken bees wing figure, and uh, this stuff sounds terrific. I'm, I'm hunting around to find the sweet spots here. Here we go. Yeah. Nice quarter sawn black walnut will sound this good. But it's nice. I, so again, this is in the category of what I would call a woody sound, a nice, uh, soft, sweet kind of. And, and that's what the guitars sound like. Uh, walnut pairs extremely well with, I, I sound like, a, like I'm a, a, a waiter recommending a wine. <laughs> <laughs> Walnut pairs extremely well with, with redwood. <laughs> um, I, have a, I have a Martin Owen that's a Claro walnut. Claro, yeah. Wonderful sound. Uh, Claro, again, it's, uh, there are some very, very good species of walnut. The, the, I, I, pr I prefer the European. The cl Claro has the best figure in general. Uh, but, um, uh, oh, a piece of wood is only as good as the sound of the guitar that you can make from it. How does one learn all this? Oh, the hard way. <laughs> <laughs> but this is, oh no, no, this is from, you know, this is from 40 years of building guitars, really. And from listening and tapping and, you know, playing every guitar that we build. Um, you know, we know we, you know, when you buy a new batch of wood, like for example, we can go back and buy more of the wood from this log for a very long time because there is so much of it. Um, and so we like the sound of it. After building a few guitars, you get the hang of what to do with it, you know, how thick it needs to be, how to voice it, um, what kinds of guitars it sounds good 
on. Um, and then sometimes you go back and that wood is gone. So what, what do you do? Well, you look for wood like it. Well, you never find wood that's exactly like it. So you say, well, this is sort of like it. And then you think, OK, what adjustments do I have to make? You know, and then you test the results. Either they're, either they're good or they're not good. So it's just a, just a continual process of uh, trial and error, really. And in the beginning, it's more error. And hopefully, as, uh, you know, as you've built more guitars, you, the, you gain a little more knowledge. Thank you. So, so here's the last uh, tone wood that I brought, Hawaiian koa. Hawa Hawaiian koa is a, an acacia. Uh, uh, you asked earlier about uh, Tasmanian blackwood. Tasmanian or Australian blackwood are from the acacia family. Uh, I went to a guitar festival in Belgium last year, and I met uh, a Tasmanian builder uh, who every part of the guitar was from a Tasmanian wood. Uh, most of it koa, the head is, or, or excuse me, blackwood, a super, super dense, dark wood that they use for the fretboard, uh, a, a wood about the weight of mahogany that they use for the neck. The back and sides were sort of a medium weight wood, and the top was some exotic thing I'd never heard of that wasn't really a, an acacia. But I guess there are quite a few species of acacia around the world. Uh, I know of an acacia tree in Brunswick, Maine. There's plenty of acacia trees in Florida. Uh, the, Hawaiians, the Hawaiians call it koa which is just a Hawaiian name for a species that happens to be acacia. Um, this is a nice, high, nicely figured Martin used, you know, nice me, sort of a medium weight figured um, acacia for a lot of ukuleles and some guitars in the 20s. Um, it's about the weight of mahogany. Some is heavier, some is lighter. Again, not ringy, not reverby, not metallic, very much out of the uh, out of the rosewood mold. It's a it, it's a very sweet sounding wood. Um, koa guitars usually outperform uh, <laughs> the wood that it's made out of. In other words, it's one of those situations where you know a, a really good koa guitar just is like this incredibly rich syrupy, you know, sound, uh, even with a koa top, especially with a koa top. Great, you know, it's just beautiful syrupy. You've heard Hawaiian lap steel guitar, you know, that I just sort of think of that. That's like the classic koa kind of sound. I think of it as being sweet and syrupy. Um, you're hearing, just tapping the piece of wood, you're hearing a sort of a soft, woody, kind of sweet sound, quite a bit of mid-range. That syrupy sound comes from being a very, having a very strong mid-range, lots of nice thick mid-range. Um, so that kind of goes through the backs that I brought. There are tons of other backs out there, woods that I've never heard of. Um, I get samples all the time, you know. And, and the way I decide whether I'm going to try something is, you know, obviously, does it look like we can sell a guitar made out of this stuff, you know? <laughs> but also, pick it up, feel it, flex it, tap it, see what it sounds like. And, um, and I'm sure next year, that, you know, you'll be seeing bourgeois guitars out of woods that we're not making this year. This, uh, is, about, this is about half roughly half of the number of species that we have on the shelves. Um, as Dana said, samples come in all the time. And also samples from different suppliers, they have their different sources, and the wood might be completely different. It might be the same species, uh, genetically speaking, but 
Canadian and lots of varieties. You know, European, uh, European maple isn't really quite the same thing as North American maple. And torrified maple is a whole other thing. We'll talk about torrified wooden in a little bit here. Have you done any work with cherry at all? <clears throat> yes, we have. We love torrified cherry. I like, ter I like cherry. Cherry is actually a lot in the walnut sound here. You know, like this kind of... Nice, sweet, kind of um, woody, um, uh, what do I want to say, uh, just sort of non metallic kind of sound. It's sustainable. And it's also very sustainable, exactly. Um, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a walnut story. A few years ago, I was, uh, well, I was introduced to Luke Bryan, the country star, by his guitar player. Um, I met him in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, for a show. Before the show, and I brought a guitar to show him. Uh, I was invited on his tour bus. And the first thing he said to me was, can you make guitars out of walnut? <laughs> you know? And I said, well, yeah, well, yes, we can. And he said, well, I have a farm in Tennessee and uh, it's 400 acres and overlooking you know where we plant soybeans and corn is this ridge and half of it is walnut and so that summer no it was the next summer i went down and we walked through uh his his ridge and we tagged a few trees and then they cut them down shipped them off to a, a walnut processing <coughs> gigantic walnut processing place in, um, <clears throat> uh, in Missouri. I think it's the largest walnut processor in the country. They make a lot of gun stock. Uh, and they have a, they, typically they, um, they have this pressurized steam. So walnut has a lot, has a lot of the sapwood and they want to get rid of the sapwood. So walnut has a ton of tannin in it if you steam it the tannins migrate into the white wood and it turns it all sort of that, sort of that silver gray walnut color. And uh, so they get a higher yield. You know, it's an expensive wood for a domestic wood. But we didn't want any of that. <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't want to lose the sapwoods. So he had a lot of it processed for, you know, cabinets, flooring, trim, whatever in his house. And, but, but I got the first pick, uh, you know, there were stack of stacks of lumber that I went through and we cut off some ends and put them on a pallet and shipped them up to Maine and resawed. Uh, and we delivered the first walnut, uh, guitar to Luke when he played the summer at Fenway park. So that was kind of a fun story from literally from, you know, from, uh, from tree to guitar. And the wood uh, sounded fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. And we've got a whole palette of it. So, <laughs> but it's a nice straight grain, medium weight. I, I, I just picked the quarter sawn sets, you know, uh, nothing figured, but <clears throat> it's, it's really pretty cool stuff. Hey, hey, I got a question for you about growing seasons. Um, <clears throat> I'm in the paper industry and I, and I know what uh, specialize in teaching paper and cell wall thickness is real important. Northern climates have a thinner cell mm -hmm. wall. And southern climates have a thicker wall. Does the wall thickness make a difference in the sound of that wood? It does in the top wood, which we're going to, we're going to be moving to. In, in the top wood, you get a summer growth and a winter growth. And the winter growth is the hard dark line, and the summer growth is sort of like the pithy line in between. So the ratio of winter to summer is what gives the wood its stiffness. So northern climates would, would be way different That's, than southern climates. Right, and northern climates would be preferred because you get more winter growth. In fact, they say that the wood that Stradivari and his contemporaries made violins from was grown essentially during the Little Ice Age in Europe, which would produce a stronger winter growth or a stronger ratio of winter growth to summer growth. A, st a higher stiffness to weight ratio. Again, the European spruce has the second highest 
uh, velocity of sound. And so a stiffer, I, I guess the higher ratio of winter growth would improve that. So let's move on to top woods. How big does a tree need to be to get a good? For a quarter sawn set, you know, we're, we have, <clears throat> the standard is eight inches. And so the center of the tree ha has to be here. And the outside of the tree is here, the sap wood. But you can't take it all the way out to the edge, and you can't take it all the way to the center just because the growth is really fast in the middle. And oftentimes out here, you get damaged because that's the living part of the tree. If it's not treated well, you know, the sugars are in this area, and the bugs come in and eat them and stain the wood, et cetera, et cetera. So you can't use a 16-inch tree. They say about a 20-inch tree and it's usually the butt of a 20 inch tree is about where, you know, for a red spruce, for example, is where they begin to cut for guitar tops. <coughs> yeah, and uh, well, yeah, that's, that's a little on the large side, but it also, the quickness of growth matters. If the tree's growing out in the open, it'll grow that big with, you know, big rings. Um, whereas you'll, we'll, we'll pass around some of these guys. This is very slow growth. Yeah, so you get the, you have got greater density. Um, the standard, for many years, the standard top wood for American made guitars was Sitka spruce. Prior to World War II, it was Adirondack spruce, most likely red spruce. I'll tell you the Adirondack spruce story. Um, Adirondack spruce <clears throat> is not a species. It is a trade name. Um, most of the pianos in this country at the, around the turn of the last century were made in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia. And the wood that the piano soundboards was made from was produced at several mills in the Adirondacks. And they produce various grades and sizes of soundboards. The wood was laminated of a couple inch thick sections of wood between four and six inches wide, nice and clear. And the, um, the specification was that the wood could either be red spruce, white spruce, or black spruce. So the red spruce was the larger of the three species and it was probably the more plentiful of the three species. Um, Martin guitars went to one particular uh, piano supplier. In fact, old Mr. Martin, uh, C.F. Martin IV, when he was still alive, told me the name of the supplier. I still have it written out. I wrote an article on Adirondack spruce in Acoustic Guitar Magazine quite a few years ago, but I called the company. They're still in business. They still make, they still make sound boards. They don't, excuse me, they still make piano sound boards. They don't cut guitar wood any, any longer. Um, they told me that when they cut sound boards, it was typically red spruce. It was almost always red spruce that uh, just because it was a much larger tree and you had to have that size in order to get a nice, you know, uh, in order to get nice even growth over eight inches of quarter, of quarter sawing. Um, <clears throat> so that's where the term Adirondack spruce came from. Did, have you ever taken old sound boards from old pianos and tried to make, uh, make them into guitars? You could do it, but the, you know, again, you, you, they're four and six inch widths. So you wouldn't get an eight inch. You'd never find an eight inch set. And it's more work than it's worth. It's probably, more, yeah, especially if I can order wood like this. You know, and it comes in a nice box. It doesn't have, it doesn't have I've antique done it. I've done it and it's not worth although, it. <laughs> although my other uh, wood to guitar or, or tree to guitar story is, is harvesting red spruce from Roke Island, Maine in their early 80s, and I produced some of the first Adiron you know, Adirondack spruce guitars, red spruce tops, 
uh, you know, made since the war. Um, and as a matter of fact, one of those guitars just came back in our door, through our door. Uh, we're trying to cut a deal to acquire it back. <laughs> um, but since 1944 or something, uh, Martin and a little bit later Gibson switched from, by the way, Gibson used red spruce from Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Um, most of the red spruce resource was heavily cut by World War II, so the larger trees were harder to get. What we're getting now is later growth wood. Uh, Maine and the Adirondack area of New York are the two largest areas, two largest sources for guitar grade red spruce. Are there people that uh, grow trees just for, this, just for guitar? No. No, because you're basically, in order to get this kind of growth pattern, you have to, the, the tree has to be grown in a forest situation. So woodlots are grown for variable harvest. Typically, most of the cutters of red spruce know that the guitar industry pays a premium, and pretty much everyone culls logs for buyers these days. I have uh, one of the, the biggest dealers in the country, Old, uh, Old Standard Spruce from Missouri, comes up with a big log truck several times a year and uh, you know takes main logs down to Missouri processes them, processes them and sells them back to me as guitar sets you know me and everyone else uh, Randy Lucas is another big supplier he does the same let's listen to some spruce uh, spruce is much lighter in weight than most of the hardwoods um, since World War II, the guitars that we grew up playing that were not vintage guitars were usually Sitka, made with Sitka spruce tops. Here's a Sitka top. Notice that almost everywhere I hold it, it sounds pretty good and musical going to be the case with most of the spruces. Most of the spruces have a higher velocity of sound than most of the hardwoods, Brazilian rosewood being the exception. So quite a bit of variety of tones and it sounds pretty good everywhere I hold it. The most common uh, wood used for pre-war guitars uh, is Adirondack or red spruce. I've told a little bit about the story of the, uh, uh, the naming of the wood. Uh, we'll listen to what it sounds like a little bit. Adirondack, um, it, you know, it seems to respond better when you hit it harder. And that's kind of like the same as with an Adirondack spruce guitar. Uh, the, the harder you hit, the more you get, essentially. It's a heavier wood. It takes a little bit to kind of set it in motion. Um, uh, the next wood on our... Uh, um, on the list here is this is a this is a this I it's been sold as Italian spruce uh, it's probably from Austria I'm not sure whether it's Norwegian or silver spruce but it's probably a cross between the two it's fairly stiff it's fairly light as I mentioned earlier um, uh, European spruce has the second highest velocity of sound let's hear what it sounds like of sound, a lot of variety, but I'm not hitting it very hard. So it's no surprise then that European spruce is a great choice and often used for fingerstyle guitars, guitars that are not 
you know, this, the sound pressure, the, the, the sound pressure level uh, is not as high as most flat picked guitars. Uh, Adirondack is often used for flat picked guitars, particularly bluegrass guitars, guitars that are made to bang on. Next is white spruce. White spruce is a lot like, and this is Canadian white spruce, sort of the area where spruce is grown also has an effect. It's fairly lightweight. It's, um, it's, it also uh, interbreeds with uh, um, Engelmann, which is another lightweight. unscrupulously sold as European spruce. So there's quite a bit of sound there. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna move on to redwood. We don't use a lot of cedar. I don't like cedar. Cedar doesn't work for me because it's not very stiff this way. I get a better result out of redwood. It gives me a nice firm bottom end which I can play around with. I can't get that out of cedar but complexity paired with lots of top end there, rich top end, typical of a cedar or a redwood guitar. Pairs great with, uh, with walnut. And then last but not least is torrified Addy. We'll take a break here afterwards. So torrefaction is a process, I like to look at it, is it's a process of artificially aging wood. A torrefied top is cooked in an, an oxygen-free environment. It's, it's cooked at, for not very long at a temperature that would burn the wood. Um, the deprivation of oxygen prevents the wood from burning. So what we're doing actually is we're cooking out the volatiles in the wood. Volatiles are pitches, resins, sugars, etc. Uh, the key is to not damage the cellulose structure of the wood if it's torrefied properly. Uh, there are different recipes for torrefying wood. Um, torrefaction increases the velocity of sound. It also uh, closes, so there are these vessels in the wood that bring water fluids from the bottom to the top, but they have these check valves all along the way to keep the water from falling down because of gravity. Those check valves are made out of a plasticky material. It, when the wood is torrefied, that plasticky material mineralizes and all of these cells are closed off. And that, um, some say that affects the, um, the resonant properties of the wood as well. Um, the result is no different from wood that's been, that's been air dried for decades. It takes that long for this process to run its course. Uh, so um, we torrefy when we can. We actually have our own kiln. We don't use it any longer because there are, we, it's hard to get consistency from batch to batch. We found, it's, we found that it's um, the way you stack the wood, you get different results from wood in the center to wood in the edge. And this stuff is just too expensive to just load up at a kiln, fire it up and see what happens. <laughs> so I, I would much rather get a stack of already torrified wood and select the ones that I want. If anyone knows, if you know anyone who wants a small torrefaction kiln, let me know.